Welcome to this third iteration of the Cambridge Center for Geopolitics Indo-Pacific Roundtable. Those of you who've been with us for all three will remember that the first roundtable we did, we had about 14 participants and no public panels. The second roundtable had about 25 participants and one public panel. And then this year we have more than 35 participants and three public panels. So we are growing and we're hopefully expanding the range, scope, and depth of the conversations around this vast, diverse, and vitally important part of the world. Um, so without then much delay, let me just thank uh, the uh, funders for this event, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of China, Taiwan, um, who have provided very generous uh, support for this and other programming at the Center on the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and also thank all of our participants uh, who are about to give us uh, very interesting uh, and enlightening presentations on a number of critical issues. The first panel uh, is on environmental emergencies in the Indo-Pacific and will be chaired uh, by Dr. Elisa Santikarn uh, of the Center for Geopolitics. So we can go ahead and get started with the panel. Okay. So, hi everyone. As Bill mentioned, I'm Elisa Santakarn and I'm a research assistant at the Center for Geopolitics here at the University of Cambridge and I'll be chairing this morning's panel on environmental emergencies in the Indo-Pacific. As a region, the Indo-Pacific contributes to over half of the world's greenhouse gas emissions while also facing some of the worst impacts of climate change therefore confronting the dual challenge of needing to build climate resilience whilst also reducing its overall carbon footprint. Over the past 60 years, temperatures in the Indo-Pacific have increased faster than the global mean, and extreme weather events have become more frequent and intense. Just last month, we saw the worst April heat wave in Asian history, with record temperatures across India, China, Thailand and Laos. The 79th Commission Session of the UN Economic and Social Commission of Asia and the Pacific, or SCAP, concluded just last weekend. Governments from across Asia and the Pacific endorsed 10 resolutions relating to climate change and its impacts. As SCAP's Race to Net Zero report concludes, now is the time to step up regional collaboration in Asia and the Pacific and join forces to accelerate climate action. But climate change isn't just an environmental issue. It's multifaceted with massive social, political, and economic implications. Projected annual economic losses within the Indo-Pacific region as a result of natural and biological hazards reach up to 1.4 trillion US dollars in a worst case scenario setting. While climate change and its impacts form a number of environmental emergencies in the region, natural resource governance and conservation measures can also produce emergencies of their own with issues arising in the form of geopolitical conflicts, with the governance of transboundary environmental commons, as well as the perpetuation of environmental injustice at the community level, where local conflicts with national and international conservation measures may emerge. One of the key features of climate change is that it doesn't abide by national borders. It's a global problem that not only produces, but is vulnerable to geopolitical tensions as it requires strong regional partnerships and increased cooperation across all levels, from international to local community, to ensure effective and just mitigation for all. On our panel today, we have with us a range of experts with experience across the Indo-Pacific, and together the panel will discuss the various dimensions of these environmental emergencies from international, state, and local levels, addressing the region's specific challenges of negative environmental impacts and their mitigation. So without any further delay, I'd like to turn over to our panelists. Uh, I'll introduce each of you individually, and then you can have some time to give your thoughts on the topic. Uh, and then I'll leave some time for questions from the audience at the end. So going down the table, first up, I'll start with Mary Mulyani, who obtained a DPhil from the School of Geography and the Environment at the University of Oxford with a thesis on climate change mitigation policy following on Red Plus institutions. Her research interests span environmental governance and institutions, including topics on community-based conservation, environmental justice and equity, indigenous people's knowledge and local community rights, transboundary resource management, deforestation, forest fires and haze pollution, the illegal wildlife trade, and human wildlife conflicts. So if you'd like to start us off. Thank you, uh, Alisa, and good morning, all. 
So my delivery today uh, actually is based on an ASEAN Environments class, an elective module that I develop and run for the master course at Oxford University since 2015. So as you know, we all know, ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, consists of 10 countries within the Indo-Pacific region, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, Brunei, the Philippines, uh, Thailand, Myanmar, Cambodia, Laos, and, and, and Vietnam. So these countries, these 10 countries, support 10% of the world's remaining tropical forests, 60% of tropical peatland and represent the world's seven largest economy with a GDP of 3.6 uh, uh, trillion US dollar last year. Of the 680 million population, 450 million are forest dependent and indigenous people. The region is challenged by environmental degradation and volatile uh, political tensions. And I will highlight actually several key transboundary environmental issues in the region which bear political implication. Firstly, forest fires that result in transboundary haze pollution. There are at least two major fires from Indonesia's forest this decade associated with El Nino year. In 2015, the resulting haze not only affected Singapore or Malaysia, but also up to the Philippines and Thailand, with 43 million people in Indonesia alone affected by severe health problems. At that year, Indonesia reported a loss of 16.1 billion US dollar, including the destruction of 2.6 million hectare forests, mainly peatland. Uh, Singapore reported 1.5 billion US dollar loss. Then in 2019, also in El Nino year, 1.6 million hectare forests, again mainly peatlands, burned in the Indonesian island of Sumatra and Kalimantan. But outside these two years, actually forest fires occur every year, including last year when more than 200 to 1,000 hectare uh, forest burn, which is actually uh, more than 29% of the size of London. So political tensions between Indonesia and the affected countries increasingly visible. Secondly, transnational environmental crime that includes smuggling of timber, wildlife, and sand. This allegedly involves crime syndicates and money laundering with actually overall illegal trade of natural resources estimated at between 70 to 213 billion US dollars. As we can imagine, the range is huge because of the illegal nature of the activities itself. In 2019, the World Bank estimated that crime in three big areas, illegal logging, fishing, and wildlife, reached 1 trillion US dollar annually. In this regard, ASEAN countries act as suppliers, but also transit points, also buyers. Actually, the illegal trades of these resources occur within the 10 ASEAN countries. Of these crimes, sand smuggling to Singapore receives little attention within academic literature. So UNEP, briefly on, on the sand smuggling, estimated that Singapore has increased its size by 20% since the 1960s, or more than 130 square kilometers, with the demand of sun for land reclamation remain high. UNEP again estimated that about 34 Indonesian islands in the, you know, in the, in the Rio archipelago next to Singapore disappeared uh, due to sand export. The government of Indonesia banned the sand export in 2007, followed by Malaysia, Cambodia, Vietnam as supplier. So criticism was not only directed towards Singapore, but also to the source countries. Um, research gaps remain to the extent of you know, how this sand smuggling to Singapore affect political tensions among these 10 ASEAN countries. Another major issue in the region is cross-border illegal fishing. 
Southeast Asia, 18% of global fish production employing 80 million people is predicted to suffer between 40 to 60% reduction in fishery catch over the next few decades due to climate change. So with depleting stocks, we can imagine fishers opportunistically exploit uh, fishing cross borders, increasing actually the risk of interstate marine conflict where China already claims right to over 90% of the China South Sea, the claim that disputed by ASEAN countries, including Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, and, and Vietnam. So the scale of illegal fishing in the region is huge. For example, Indonesia losses approximately 3 billion US dollars a year, which is 25% of the country's fishery value. So these are just some of the transboundary uh, environmental issues in Southeast Asia. There is also an issue of hydropower development. I, I met one of you this morning, you know, that actually one of your students conduct research on this. So China also involved in the region with over 22 large hydropower projects uh, placed in the upper Mekong Delta, which directly affect the lower uh, Mekong countries. Um, Right, so political tension resulting from either strong measures or inaction by certain governments in Southeast Asia is increasingly visible. For example, in 2014, Indonesia implemented a vessel sinking policy and sank over 300 foreign ships in four years. In the same year, in 2014, Singapore enacted the Haze Pollution Act basically placing criminal and civil liability on both Singaporean and foreign entities that suspected to cause his to Singapore. So I, I want to close this delivery uh, by saying this. So ASEAN environmental governance has increasingly adopted legally binding agreements, albeit that actually most of the governance are marked by soft law rather than hard law. However, the problems persist. And the scale of environmental issues, the transboundary issues, shows not only environmental emergency, in my opinion, but also socioeconomic emergencies. This relates to the establishment of a shadow economy by the organized crime syndicates that undermines the governments in the region to govern its borders and economy. ASEAN principle of non-interference has been argued by many analysts as the main factor that hinders solving these transboundary environmental issues in the region. There is no enforcement mechanism in the regional level, the burden of compliance and enforcement placed on member states. So this is my question actually, Alisa. <laughs> so uh, I look forward to our discussion, but whilst ASEAN claim that by respecting each other's internal affairs, it facilitates cooperation and creates security community. My question is this, can this non-interference policy continue to suppress the latent political tensions amongst the member states? And can this non-interference policy continue to prevent them, the dispute, from developing into interstate conflicts and, and how this actually latent political tension may affect broader political dynamics in the region. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs> and that is a great and very big question, but hopefully we can open it up to the rest of the panel afterwards to discuss. So up next we have Dr. Liana Chua, who is a social anthropologist with research interests in ethnic politics, indigeneity, religious conversion, resettlement and environmental change in Malaysian Borneo, where she has worked with rural Bidia communities since 2003. She currently leads the Global Lives of the Orangutan Project, ERC, a multi-sided exploration of the social, political and aesthetic dimensions of the global nexus of orangutan conservation in the age of the Anthropocene. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Alyssa, and thank you uh, to all of you for coming. It's uh, it's really fun to be in a kind of interdisciplinary space like this. Um, I'm going to try and pick up on some of the points that we've just discussed, but from my sort of 
slightly more small scale position on the ground, um, you know, as somebody who's really interested in the bumpiness and the, and the messiness of real life as people live through it. Um, so I, I guess if, if we've just had a wonderful kind of discussion of what happens in the sort of transboundary ASEAN uh, space of environmental emergencies, I'm going to try and look at things a little bit more from the ground up, but you know, with a bit of big picture stuff as well. So let me just start by sharing a few very brief thoughts that I hammered out this morning um, about environmental emergencies in the region. And some of this will pick up on what we've just heard as well. Um, the first point um, is really to try and uh, reinforce Elisa's earlier point about how you know, in the Indo-Pacific region is not only um, vulnerable to the impacts of planetary crises like, in, like climate change, it is also shaping them, right? It is also a sort of planetary agent in this particular age. So for example, um, you know, the, the worst forest fires um, we've had in recent years took place in 2015, um, and they raged across Sumatra and Borneo in Indonesia. These released about 100 billion tons of carbon into the atmosphere within two months. I mean, that's a significant contribution to global emissions in one year, right? And I think that, that really kind of underlines um, how important it is um, to consider how this region also acts on various planetary processes. Um, <clears throat> and this in turn is important because um, it also raises important questions about um, who is doing the acting and therefore who should be held accountable for certain developments and certain um, actions in this moment of environmental crisis. Um, the second point I want to try and draw out, which we've already heard brilliantly about, is this point about the transnational complexities involved in environmental emergencies. Um, to go back to the 2015 forest fires, um, you know, these were very much, they were national affairs in many ways. They were concentrated in industrial plantations and rural small holdings in specific parts of Indonesian Borneo and Sumatra. But of course, their effects traveled much further, right? As we've just heard, they gave rise to this noxious haze that blanketed very large parts of Southeast Asia. They caused all sorts of diplomatic incidents, um, a somewhat fraught, somewhat piecemeal um, and haphazard national and international responses. And of course, as Indonesia quite snarkily and rightly pointed out, the capital for a lot of these industrial plantations that were being blamed was actually coming from an awful lot of countries that were being affected and criticizing Indonesia for this problem. So, you know, it was a bit like, you know, back off, right? This, this, is, this is not only our problem. And I think what this example really points to, which we've already heard about, um, are, are the sorts of transnational challenges that are emerging in these spaces of environmental emergency. Um, transnational cooperation has been much lauded. It can work wonders. But I think this 2015 um, haze really underlines um, how the transnational nature of certain environmental emergencies can actually work to also obfuscate causality and blame, and thus diffuse accountability and responsibility across a whole bunch of different players and boundaries and jurisdictions. So we heard, for example, about how national sovereignty right, is being very selectively conjured and, in, and evoked in these situations. And I think, I, I think this in turn then raises some quite thorny questions, which are still unresolved, about the possibilities of redress and repair in, environment, in environmental emergencies that stretch beyond the nation state. Um, so that's my second point. Um, <clears throat> the third point, and this is where the sort of small scale perspective comes in a little bit more, is the unevenness of environmental emergencies. Um, now for countries like Singapore, which is where I'm from, the haze is a seasonal problem. It only becomes an environmental emergency in certain months of the year when you can smell it and you can see it, right? But for indigenous and other rural communities in these burning zones, as well as the wildlife, the environments that they live alongside, fire and haze are actually part of a much um, larger and longer running constellation of structural problems, including receding forests and land rights, frontier development, state neglect, but also co coercion and large scale surveillance. And I think, you know, that this sort of unevenness and the experience of that haze and those fires really points to how environmental emergencies are never flat, right? Their, their, their causes and their impacts are always going to be unevenly distributed. But what we tend to find here, and this is definitely what anthropologists and geographers, for example, tend to notice in our fieldwork, is that those who are worst affected by environmental emergencies tend to be the ones who are least culpable. And there's a very clear imbalance here. However, this sort of unevenness isn't necessarily always reflected in technocratic and political responses to such emergencies, because these tend to be built around a fairly homogenized um, and generically culpable figure of humanity, humanity at large, you know, that Anthropos is responsible for the problems of the Anthropocene, right? And in fact, what we find is that a lot of these technocratic responses can exacerbate existing inequalities as happened um, in the aftermath of the 2015 fires when there was this sort of blanket criminalization of all forms of burning within certain provinces in Borneo, plantation, small scale, 
Sweden agriculture, whatever, which actually had a disproportionate effect on already marginalized communities, particularly Sweden cultivators who were already fairly squashed by the state and worrying about land grabs and um, the erosion of their land rights. Um, and this in turn led to a whole series of knock-on political effects. Okay, so those were just a handful of big picture issues um, that I wanted to pluck out for, for our discussion today. Um, to finish, I just want to touch very briefly on a few ways that I think that we, you know, as critical social scientists, but also various other people who are interested in the fate of this region, um, might start to grapple with these big issues. And this is really based on my experience of working on small picture issues. Um, so I think the first suggestion I want to throw out is that maybe we need to rethink the temporal and political framing of environmental emergencies as emergencies. So I wanna question the premise of this entire roundtable. Um, as I suggested earlier, what might look like emergencies to us from the outside are often everyday realities for those who live with and through them. Um, so we tend to view you know, emergencies as these exceptional temporally bounded events that disrupt normality, whatever normality is, which in turn justifies swift and strong intervention. But for many parts of the Indo-Pacific region, particularly for rural and, and indigenous communities, environmental emergencies are everyday unfolding realities. They're much more of a slow burn than a sudden shock. Um, so I, I think the question I wanna pose here is how else might we grapple with the environmental emergencies that we face if we didn't frame them from the outset as emergencies? What other temporal frameworks might we use to understand what's going on? And also what other politics might emerge if we paid serious attention to the everyday rhythms and effects of environmental problems? Um, the second suggestion is that I think it's important to nuance our view of the anthropogenic. Um, as I briefly suggested earlier, many policy solutions to environmental crisis still tend to revolve around a kind of nature protection paradigm. Right? So the anthropogenic is bad for nature, we need to protect nature from the anthrop anthropogenic. But of course, there's anthropogenic and then there's anthropogenic. So oil palm plantations are not the same as Sweden's and ancestral fruit trees and hunting grounds of an indigenous community in Borneo. Um, so the question I want to pose here is, what might we gain from thinking with that sort of anthropogenic variation and complexity? So ju just to give you a really quick example from our fieldwork in Indonesian Borneo, we've been trying to explore how indigenous understandings of guest host relations and the ideals of reciprocity, beneficence, and obligation that are tied up in these relations might help us and conservationists to reframe the land politics of orangutan conservation. So rather than treating orangutans and forests as things to be protected from local communities, our question here is how might conservationists actually work with and within existing social and moral frameworks and make themselves and their orangutans good guests on indigenous people's lands? Again, that's sort of reversing the whole logic. And then my final suggestion is that um, it could be interesting to think about how we look and listen beyond the anthropos, beyond the human. And this is a challenging question for social scientists because we think about humans and sociality as you know, things that humans have. Um, and here I often go back to a question that one of my collaborators, who's an orangutan conservation scientist, once asked, which is, what do orangutans want? Okay. And he said, well, you know, we, we all think we know what they need. They need big patches of forest. But has somebody actually asked what the orangutans themselves want? Um, and I think this remark was interesting because it was made in the context of new research that showed how orangutans could, quite surprisingly, survive in heavily modified human landscapes, including oil palm plantations and former industrial logging um, concessions. And this completely threw orangutan conservation strategy into disarray because suddenly conservationists had to ask, not only how do we protect large tracts of forests for orangutans, how do we protect orangutans in these anthropogenic landscapes? And to answer these questions, they had to try and figure out what the orangutan's point of view actually was. What do the orangutans want? So I think it's a challenging but generative question because um, I think it pushes us to attend more carefully to the non-human agencies and the more than human relations that exist in these spaces of environmental emergency. And this is maybe where I think we can learn from people like my indigenous interlocutors who also ask similar questions about animals and waterways, rocks, plants, whatever. You know, these are questions that are often rooted in their specific empirical lived experience, their own scientific methods in a way, and their engagements with their environments. Uh, and finally, I think this question could also push us to ask not only who environmental emergencies impact, but also what they impact and how those impacts unfold in various ways. And this in turn might invite us to, ta to start to take more seriously the agencies and the cultures and experiences of non-human others and what these might bring to discussions about redress, repair and justice in this age of environmental emergencies. So I'll leave it there. Thank you.
Okay, so following on, we have Heike Schroeder, who is a Professor of Environmental Governance in the School of International Development at the University of East Anglia. Her work focuses on global environmental politics, forest governance, and the international climate negotiations, indigenous peoples and knowledge and sustainable development, trust and sustainable food governance. She was PI for the GCRR ESRC funded Indigenous International Interactions for Sustainable Development project and has held previous positions at the University of California, Santa Barbara and Oxford. Thank you very much. And actually, I think the progression is working very well because I want to take us even further into the local level. Um, I will talk about a case that was part of what you just mentioned, our Indigenous Sustainable Development Project funded by GCRF ESRC, where we worked in, um, in, in Uganda, Bolivia, and also um, Papua New Guinea. And I'm going to talk about the Papua New Guinea case. We went into um, a indigenous community in the western province, so very far west, very remote, quite close to the border. Um, the, the, the people there name themselves the Min, so I will refer to them as the Min, that actually just means the people. And um, they lived in the bush um, and um, by their own accounts very happily until uh, a mine um, was, was built on their um, sacred mountain where they go only to hunt in 1984 by the Australians originally. Um, the commotion kind of created a little bit of curiosity. So the, um, the, some of the tribes went down to have a look and um, the miners then asked them, are you the, the original landowners? And they just said yes. And then they, um, um, actually signed an agreement that they claimed they didn't really understand at the time. So that tribe actually did receive loyalties, um, royalties um, from the mining company. Other tribal um, members and tribes for, of the Min people uh, followed and they partly settled around the mine area. They were quite curious and they also were quite interested in the ideas of schooling, taking you know, their, their kids to school. So they spent quite a bit of um, the, the time, time in, in, in the year there. Um, this mine is actually the largest, third largest gold and copper mine in the world, um, Octeddy it's called. What's interesting is that um, this kind of intervention into this area that was incredibly remote um, brought some level of development to the people. So there were roads, there were um, schools, um, hospital, um, some kind of infrastructure there. And the, the Min people were quite interested in that proposition of development, but they realized that they were only half in um, and they actually in the end only, you know, um, access the disadvantages of that, that development that occurred um, in that they um, still lived in settlements without running water and electricity, but now they have Wi-Fi and there's Coca-Cola to be had around every corner, um, not even bottled water, but just soft drinks. And that created a situation where you get, you know, five-year-old children screaming of pain because their mouth is full of cavities and uh, six-month-old babies are fed um, Fanta, for example. And the implications of that, of course, um, cannot be addressed because there isn't enough health infrastructure there. The mine also, of course, um, created quite um, a lot of environmental problems, both in terms of um, the wildlife life disappearing and no more hunting, um, and also then the people losing their traditional ways, um, their traditional food sources, but also being roped in somewhat to a more settled lifestyle um, and that not practicing their traditional ways, not being able to pass them on to younger generations. Um, and so they lost a lot of their own um, identity, culture, etc. But they felt they feel that they are neither in nor out. So they're partly in um, to a new way of life, but they're not benefiting. They're not actually, they're, they're seeing the wealth, but they're not able to actually access it. And um, th this is why they are actually quite disgruntled by the situation. Um, and 
we went in as part of the project to really listen to them and their, we, we wanted to understand what their perspective was on sustainable development and also their, fu their future visions. And um, what we found out was really that it was a very confusing picture for them. So on one hand, they wanted what they saw, but they didn't have. And on the other hand, they also realized they were losing their traditional ways. And so they ended up not really having anything. We also were interested to find out um, how things had changed um, through COVID. And um, one important element there is that because they weren't able to um, access to travel to their um, forest gardens where they would harvest half of their, 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 their food um, um, source. They um, started to eat more unhealthily, more processed and, and visibly became obese, which then actually led them to realize how valuable their own traditional ways and food sources were to them. So a bit of a strengthening of that. In terms of climate change, which was really one major element of our project, climate change and resource extraction, um, the interesting story there, and I will kind of tell the story from their perspective, is that it was quite a foreign um, concept to them. They mainly hadn't heard of climate change or perceived it. Um, there had been two droughts in the recent years, in the re in recent decades, one in um, 2015 and the other one in um, 1987, I think. And they interestingly um, said that everything dried out during that time except for their, their sago and wild yam. And they actually think that um, it was, and I'm not quite sure who they refer to, whether people or spirits, but it was someone protecting their people um, and, and, and punishing the, the, the um, the, the mine, the miners. The, there is also a river, a quite kind of wide river, the Fly River, that was completely dry. So the mine had used up all the, the water, the available water in the area. So what my kind of time, and maybe I'll just um, um, share a little um, um, quotation from how they talk, is that, um, they say that they now rely on white men's lifestyle. Um, they refer to it as fake life, not their own life. Um, their life was rich um, and different. Um, it re resonated with the land. And then they also say that our traditional life connects us to mother nature and we, were in turn, we would in turn protect and pay homage to our land. White man is not respecting the land and its custodians. White man is ripping and molesting mother nature. And I suppose that really shows how um, disillusioned, disgruntled they are by the intervention of development in the area where they are not directly benefiting much at all. And they're actually really um, you know, faced with the, uh, consequ the adverse consequences. And so I think what I want to say with this is that there is a very local dimension to any kind of global intervention that we tend to not look at, we tend to uh, ignore. Um, and I think that's a, a huge issue to address. And if we do look, we tend to assume we know what's best for them and, and, and go in with our way of you know, interpreting um, what's needed. But often that is not what is desired by the local people. Um, and I'll leave it here. Yeah, thank you. And to round it all off, we have Alexander Cullen, who's a human geographer who primarily examines issues of livelihood transitions, territoriality and environmental subjectivity through a political ecology lens. His research has been attentive to state community tensions in relation to land rights and post-conflict conservation governance across Southeast Asia, but with particular interest in Timor-Leste. He's also an experienced international development practitioner, having worked broadly across issues such as local governance, land conflict, microfinance, and public transport in Southeast Asia. So, Alexander. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for this invitation. Um, my, my talk might be a little bit shorter just because some of these fantastic points, or the points that I wanted to raise, have already been brought out by our speakers previously, um, which I appreciate especially seeing some synergy across there. Um, I mean, especially this issue, I think that perhaps we can 
uh, talk a little bit later around, around this idea of emergency, as well as notions of accountability, is something that really needs to be untangled a little bit more when we think about how environmental narratives around conflict kind of emerge. Um, but I'll zoom out a little bit um, and uh, back up to the nation state and focus my attention to Timor-Leste which uh, I, I've had a, a long-standing engagement with, working with uh, some researchers and collaborators there um, for almost uh, two decades now. Um, in terms of the way that Timor-Leste is going to be impacted, um, it is a very, very small half-island country that is incredibly mountainous um, and on very, very steep slopes. It is a country that experiences a three-month-long uh, hungry season annually um, and this is fairly traumatic, still and ongoing, for the 70% of the, uh, the population that is uh, Sweden or uh, normal or uh, otherwise agriculturalists. Um, what climate change uh, is anticipated to bring about, but is uh, and is already instigating, um, is certainly a greater pressure when it comes to uh, rain-fed agriculture and the issues around this. Um, Already, uh, the, uh, the weather system sort of fluctuates with Enzo. So during El Nino years, there is often long tries, which are very, very problematic. And during La Nina years, there is often a nonstop rain that can occur. Um, with climate change, generally, the rain is supposed to become uh, much, much uh, shorter in terms of its volume, but much, much more intense and erratic when that comes. And this is highly problematic in terms of erosion, considering that so many Sweden agriculturalists actually use the very, very steep slopes and, and has endured um, almost 500 years of uh, colonial and occupation rule, which has removed a large amount of the, uh, I guess, original vegetation um, that is often an integral part of Sweden agricultural lives there. Um, one of the other key ways that climate change is going to impact Timor is certainly through uh, changes with fishing, um, and it's part of the Coral Triangle. Uh, fishing in itself and the warming of the seas is uh, certainly a huge issue there, but also a large amount of runoff coming through erosion um, that comes out through the rivers, which are kind of uh, very, very uh, shallow, braided ones that bring a lot of silt down when you have these very, very large uh, rains that come out. Finally as well, um, with, the, with the warming uh, temperature, uh, what we anticipate to see as well is uh, mosquito-borne diseases moving further up the mountainscape where a, a large number of agriculturalists actually live. Uh, malaria was actually uh, quite rightly recognised as um, a fantastic um, achievement in terms of being wiped out um, not more than five or six years ago in Timor. But there is um, a real risk of this returning along with other mosquito-borne diseases and this travelling further up the slopes. Um, what this leads to as well is the fact that Timor is one of the most, uh, I guess, climate um, at risk countries in terms of the changes uh, that it will have to endure. Um, and yet, um, as others have already pointed out, uh, the vast majority of Timorese people, like many of the other, especially indigenous in Southeast Asia, um, they have done very little to contribute to the particular um, uh, effects that bring about this kind of, um, I guess, uh, carbon violence. There is a, a very, very strong climate uh, justice dimension here. Those most impacted have often benefited the least from it, or in some cases, as I might argue in Timor-Leste, um, they have endured underdevelopment conflict and crisis because of the geopolitics and political economic processes that seek to produce such carbon extractivity. Uh, uh, Timor-Leste is a the youngest country in Southeast Asia that remains highly dependent upon oil and petrocapitalism for its very, very meagre um, financial position. It is 80% dependent upon that. Um, and yet, how do we reckon and wrestle with this as a particular key issue when the vast majority of the Timorese have not ever in enjoyed uh, the benefits that have been uh, uh, sought and uh, and got otherwise elsewhere, particularly in the global north, when it comes to extractivism. A point that I'd like to bring up here though, although I know that the remit is wider than climate change, um, climate change is perhaps the most famous iteration of this at the moment, is it's important to recognise that climate change is not the instigator of crisis and conflict, um, especially in the region. There are long-standing uneven development, uh, marginalisation, economic suppression and political oppression from states as well as economic liberalisation, which often play into far greater factors around conflict, as well as the production of vulnerability. 
In many cases, some of what we see, or perhaps that makes headlines, is very much a climate change event. Um, that is sometimes the straw that breaks the camel's back. This is not to say that climate change and its impacts are not relevant um, and are not manifest in, in a very difficult and challenging way for everyday lives. But nonetheless, they are one of many. And missing this is a great problem, especially when it comes to intervention within the, within the region. There is often now, as there is a rush with development to uh, synergy or dovetail with adaptation or mitigation strategies, um, to, uh, I, I think in particular, um, have a dangerous complacency that somehow adaptation and poverty development will seamlessly meld together when that is not necessarily the case at all. The last case, or the last thing that I will raise perhaps is uh, a growing spectre. And I'll move my attention from Timor-Leste, which is experiencing, starting to experience this a little bit more, um, but more to a case study that I was looking at in Myanmar prior to the military coup. And this, I would argue, is a, represents uh, the issue of growing, growing climate authoritarianism. Uh, this is climate change in itself, um, or the impacts of climate change being used as an apolitical imperative for particular authoritarian regimes or those in power and government to instigate particular plans um, without the political contestation that might come with that. Uh, uh, with a group of um, activists in uh, Yangon and with uh, University of Melbourne, uh, we instigated um, uh, an intervention um, in terms of looking at this new project, which is the new Yangon City, which is to be built on the left bank of um, just outside of Yangon. This is a, a floodplain and traditionally has never been settled. Um, and, and yet this is a huge amount of so-called available land, um, which was needed for a vastly growing population in Yangon. The reason, of course, that this had not ever been actually developed was because it annually floods, and those floods were getting worse and worse. But more importantly, because of that vulnerability of that land and the area there, this was where a large number of migrants, and particularly those that were undocumented, actually lived. This prime real estate was given the impetus for development and uh, intervention into that area by the state under the grounds that this was um, an area in which it was prone to greater climate change happening. Some might more cynically argue that this is simply a real estate grab for those that were um, in power in the government at the time, or at least within the municipal government. These are particular aspects that are going to be growing. Within Myanmar, um, climate change is becoming more and more of an important driver, especially when it comes to migration, of which many people move to Mandalay or to Yangon, and the pressures that that puts under there in terms of their living conditions, uh, poor work and health and access to education. At the moment, the um, almost uh, two million people of the two million people that were displaced by uh, the cyclone in 2007, um, many of them still reside in this particular area on the left bank. Um, and on top of that, many of the rice fields that they would actually used to used to use are now being inundated by salt water that is creeping up um, uh, the Angon River. So that is perhaps the last point um, I'll leave with, but I think it's an important one to bear in mind as well when we think about this idea of emergency, but also crisis um, and how we understand that. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone. Before we move into some questions, I just wanted to give you all a chance to see if you wanted to respond to one another, if you had any questions for one another or comments on what each of you has said. Right, good stuff. Yeah. Um, so, Liana, thank you. Uh, and also, Heike, I think, you know, your story and also Liana's story about, you know, first of all, Heike, you mentioned about the intervention by the external actor, you know, you know, on a local community. And then I remember, Liana, when I, when I did my own research in, in central Kalimantan, the Indonesian part of Borneo, uh, I lived with the indigenous Dayak community. And then in my research, I actually asked about the story of orangutan protection in that area. And at, at that time, it was research based on red plus, you know, red plus implementation on the ground. So my experience was uh, interesting because most of the community members that I met, they basically felt that they were not chosen by the government and by the external actor who came to the villages because they cared more about orangutan. 
because you know the poverty level was huge and then they basically said that orang utan had uh, milk every day but not their children so this is something which which you know it just remind me when you mentioned about how you how external actor including perhaps me you know i'm indonesian but i came from jakarta and i was you know i was not immediately accepted as of course as local but throughout you know throughout the time i live with them they basically open up and say well actually we need milk for our children and this is and 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 also your notion about the daily life of emergencies uh, experienced by the people there there was very little resources on the ground to actually not open the the land using little bit of fires so during the dry season then you know eventually particularly most of the land you know there uh, actually you know opened for plantation uh, peatland so of course if peatlands dry it then they are so you know easily burned by just little fires so one of i think one of the researcher from australia national university takoni argued that the most important thing to basically address this transboundary haze pollution which occur every every year is actually to bring large scale of funding to help mitigate the issue on the local level and not necessarily you know at the national level so so i thought you know that that's just what i uh, get from Heike and from um, from Liana and and thank you for telling us the story about Myanmar also I mean actually we we have somebody who has been exposed in Myanmar's development also uh, here so perhaps you know <laughs> uh, Anthony can also provide his uh, his empirical empirical work in in Myanmar thank you Alisa thank you very much would anyone else like to Comment. Yeah. I, I could respond very quickly to that um, because I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, <clears throat> we, we have heard the refrain that conservationists care more about animals than humans everywhere. I mean, right across Borneo, you know, it, it's such a sort of common recurring theme. Um, <clears throat> and I think, you know, apart from the fact that it kind of creates a huge amount of uh, ground level resentment, because you're right, you know, people really notice, you know, you get these pictures of orangutan rehabilitation centers circulating on social media, you know, in, in, in towns and cities. Um, and people are constantly asking, well, yeah, they've got, they've got x-rays, they've got powdered milk, they've got nappies. We've got none of that stuff in our villages. You know, what's going on, right? Why do these conservationists care so much? And then what, we, what we've also done through our research is kind of overlaid that onto, um, you know, a, a sort of discussions with different indigenous groups in the area, most of whom actually don't care very much about orangutans. I mean, not in the sense that they, they dislike them. I mean, sometimes they do. Um, but in the sense that, you know, orangutans are just not that significant, um, you know, in this kind of wider multi-species tapestry of life in these regions. They're just not things that you pay very much attention to. So, you know, one of the problems is precisely that um, conservation has made orangutans significant, but they've done so by plucking them out of this kind of larger set of relations of accountability, which means that local people can't touch them you know, if they, if they damage their crops or eat their fruits or anything like that. And so that, that kind of exacerbates that sense of, you know, lack of care, right? It's not just that conservationists care more about animals. It's also that we get completely squashed by the state because the laws are also stacked against us. So there's very much this, this, this feeling of, you know, there being a kind of pincer movement of the state conservationists and occasionally companies kind of all coming in together and they've all got vested interests in indigenous lands, but for different reasons. Um, and there's very much this sense of, you know, what's, you know, what's going on? There's, there's a, there are all these people who want to do stuff on our lands and tell us how to live without necessarily paying attention to us. Um, and, I guess, and I guess that kind of brings back this point about how, you, you know, those, those sorts of international level, regional <laughs> level solutions aren't going to make much difference unless those sorts of ground level problems and inequalities actually get redressed um, and, and that's a much harder thing to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yes, thank you everyone. Um, incredibly interesting and, and, and rich um, conversations and you know, some of the themes are around you know, what is an emergency to whom, um, crisis as well, um, agency, um, really kind of you know, um, looking at 
the way in which um, agendas play out um, at different levels of governance across you know, the international, the national and the local, really creating very different stories and also distorting many times the realities. Um, it's very difficult from you know, an international interventionist perspective to get a big picture um, understanding of everything um, holistically. And so we go in and we do one thing. We don't necessarily realize the, the kind of broader consequences of that intervention on other elements um, of, of that, let's say, ecosystem, like with the orang utans. So then we create um, a, a certain level of disharmony in that intervention that's un, 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 you know, intended yet is existent and we, use, we tend to not address it. Um, I think there's, there's a lot to um, be had for really kind of going into the communication element and really being aware of you know, where these misunderstandings and mistranslations might happen and, and, and resulting just, you know, tensions and, and perhaps conflicts result. I think that's a really important element that we probably don't pay enough att attention to, especially because everything is rushed and um, time, you know, time sensitive, et cetera, because we are so responsive. We tend to go in somewhere when there's a so-called emergency from maybe a you know, media perspective, and we miss out on what's actually day to day and what the real kind of survival topics are for the people on the ground we just go in and try and, and you know um, take out that fire but by doing that we miss a lot I think that's something that we've all kind of addressed in, 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 in a way I think that's a very important topic yeah thank you yeah, that, that's very well put. I mean, only a, a year ago, two years ago, uh, Dili in East Timor was hit by its worst floods that it's ever endured. Um, I think about 50 people lost their lives. Um, 14,000 houses, I think, were, were ruined and um, almost the same number uh, displaced. And, and what makes this more remarkable is the fact that, I mean, this is a very dry area. This is an area on a very, very dry stretch of coast. And this idea that, um, where there's uh, water insecurity and the, the table's dropping, that there can be these, these floods that come in, is a really difficult thing to reckon with. But it doesn't come about just in this particular moment because of a large storm. This is a cascade of, of problematic sort of uh, underdevelopment that's, that's occurred and uneven development in terms of um, poor sanitation that's been put in, but also uh, difficulties in terms of housing and where people are allowed, let alone um, a lack of security in terms of where people have been able to, to build their homes, a lot of which are, um, uh, have been uh, structured along uh, the riverbank. Um, and, and these, so there is this array of political and economic issues which seem to only bubble up in these particular large events. Mm -hmm. And this is often what captures us. Um, and, and that can be really valuable. But to only focus on that and not the underlying issues mm -hmm. is to do a real disservice to the idea that these are challenges that can be met or that can be better understood. I mean, on that topic of, con of conservation as well, um, in that same issue around climate authoritarianism is also something that we've seen in the past, obviously, around biodiversity mm -hmm. authoritarianism in certain ways. Um, it, it's no coincidence that some of the most uh, biodiverse areas in Myanmar are the ones that are on the fringes um, or the frontiers where there is the vast concentration of different ethnic groups, different ethnic groups that have often been, um, you know, in opposition to the central uh, Burma government. Um, and this becomes a, a really uh, convenient, perhaps imperative for um, intervention into these areas by the state um, on behalf of this idea of global biodiversity. Now, it's not saying that conservation is, is something that is uh, an issue which is totalitarian in, in sense and should not be amused, but it's important to understand the politics of this and, and how this occurs. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm st this seems like a, just a, a strange anecdote, but um, one of the largest tiger parks in the world is in the top of, um, in the north of Myanmar, in the Kayan area, um, and there's not a single tiger in there, um, but it's been uh, designated as such because it's important for the government to have a stronghold in there. But also at the same time, they've used some of that land in which kind people have been taken out of in order to establish uh, logging rights and logging regimes. I must say this was before the coup. I'm not sure what the state of that is now. Um, but this is just but one example. I think the same thing is happening at the border as well, uh, close to 
Thailand as well at the moment with the, um, the shore to mountain um, new national park that's being developed in Ketchum State. Um, sorry, I think I've got that, that name wrong. But um, this, is, this isn't just one-offs. These become key important sort of instigators for those in power to be able to think about how particular notions of the contemporary rule can be reactualized in the age of climate change or the Anthropocene. Yeah, thank you very much. And I think what I really liked about this panel is we are talking about local level impacts when we are talking <coughs> about these big global issues and challenges as well. And Mary, you brought up the question of um, haze pollution and things like that. And um, I was thinking about haze pollution in relation to what sort of geopolitical issues it brings up in terms of like, you're saying with Singapore, they instituted you know, fines or penalties for countries that um, impact air pollution in Singapore because the air is not, um, it's a transboundary issue. Um, but then in Thailand, a lot of the, the burning and the pollution from burning is attributed to Swidden agriculture and to indigenous communities who practice this agricultural system mm -hmm. and who are marked as different from Thai people because mm -hmm. they don't do wet rice farming, which is what marks Thai identity. Um, and then it's often called slash and burn farming and then um, kind of demonized in this way. And then responsibility is shifted away from the state or the majority of Thai people in, in their duty to enact good environmental practices and shifted onto the indigenous people. Um, but then more recently in Thailand as well, we have a lot of discussion on, oh no, this burning is coming not from Thai people and not necessarily from indigenous people in Thailand, but from our bordering countries, it's coming from Myanmar or from Laos. Um, so there's many scales of, of these issues, but I think it's really important to account for that local level. Um, and so, Alexander, what you were saying kind of leads me into a question that I had thought of before in terms of the regional issues of environmental justice and more specifically of human rights and how human rights is entangled with conservation agendas. Um, and I don't know if any of you followed COP15 at the end of last year, uh, but they set a series of conservation targets, including one that's commonly been called 30 by 30. And that's um, the effective conservation and management of 30% of our planet's lands and waters by 2030. And that received some pushback from indigenous communities in particular over fears that this would perpetrate this, what we would call fortress conservation models or this authoritarianism um, in the name of environmental conservation used to justify the removal of indigenous peoples from ancestral land. Um, and I was wondering if any of you had any thoughts on this sort of target or the way that conservation is enacted in this very authoritarian and way that separates people from the land. Um, yeah, so if you had any thoughts, it's a big question. <laughs> I, I can't remember the exact figures, but there is a, a wealth of, of land that is protected and looked after by indigenous communities um, where diversity is by diversity is the highest in the world. I mean, there's a very clear correlation between the, where there are indigenous communities um, living on and with the land by diversity is the most kind of, you know, um, healthy. And um, so naturally, communities that live of the land look after the land with a, an, a perspective of you know seven generations um, into the future and that they do what they need to do to preserve um, the the wealth and the richness and and, and the health of, of the land um, you know in a in, in a sustainable a way as we can ever imagine so there is no question that 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 is you know um, the best way. But I think a lot of interventions, including a Red Plus, have actually addressed the little you know, bit of, of harvesting of the, um, the, the preserved land that happens locally as the problem. And so then they've moved out indigenous communities out of the new preservation area. And I think that's caused a lot of grief and difficulty and, and challenge and ten tension at the end of the day. Um, I think a lot of interventions have actually been rather ill-conceived Ill in that regard. 
Is that answering your question? <laughs> yes, uh, I mean, and then in, in Indonesia, for example, I did, I did my DPhil research on red plus actually also like how, I mean, coming back to, I think, I think your, also your remark, Heike, about, about local communities understanding climate change as a concept is, is not straightforward. So when I was on the ground, the indigenous people, uh, you know, the Daya uh, people actually, could not understand why we kept talking about carbon. I mean, the concept of carbon, they, they, you know, it just, you know, so distant from them. And, and many of them still thought that carbon is this, you know, the, the paper, the carbon paper that, you know, that we used to do it, you know, for the manual type. So, and then of course, if we discuss about the notion of indigenous people and land, then uh, I think more and more countries or national governments not try to put it on the legal system on what indigenous is. For example, in Indonesia with, you know, more than three, 300 different ethnicity, every ethnic basically claim that they are indigenous. So then they could then claim their land, but then the government stepped in to say, well, actually you can only be considered in indigenous community if you, you, the community, actually practice, you know, certain indigenous uh, norms, but not really adopting the modern, you know, the modern practice of, you know, of Indonesia as a nation state. So that's also another another problem when it comes to land. And then uh, on the ground also, there are quite a number of, of norms and practice by the indigenous people to actually claim land uh, de facto. So by planting lands in some of the uh, indigenous Daya practice, basically they claim de facto of land tenure. And, and, and yesterday, actually in Oxford, somebody uh, presented their research on Peru, the indigenous people in Peru, and you are correct, that actually the number of biodiversity and conservation within indigenous people land much higher than the non-indigenous people land. So that's my contribution, thank you. Yeah. Mm. Maybe just a small point on 30 by 30, which I think is, yeah, mm. it's a really, a really important point for discussion, I think, as conservation moves forward in this moment, especially because of the amount of media that's, that's attended. Um, but one small point on that, I guess, is um, quite similar to, I guess, 1.5 as, uh, as an emissions target. This quantification is really mm. very problematic in terms of missing the messiness of what conservation is and how that works, but also this idea that there is like a singular number in which um, that somehow brings about the, the kind of future and environments that, that we somehow all collectively want as well. Um, I mean, there's just such a great diversity in terms of that land or what that actually means in terms of different ecologies. Um, and so that, that can become really, really mm. problematic if that mm. becomes just like a hard target of something that you see. It also means for that 30% that you do save, what does that mean for the other? I mean, is this sacrifice zones? Mm. Are these ideas in which, yeah. you know, we have <coughs> this idea of a, a high biodiversity that is somehow remnant there, but everything mm. else is lost for attention. Mm. In that same way that degraded areas are just let go mm -hmm. sometimes rather than being reinvested in and looking for renewal and repair. Yeah. We saw this with Red Plus as well, the problem of leakage. You mm. might be able to conserve one area, but the drivers of, of deforestation just move elsewhere and then you have increased deforestation in another area or country. So you really have to have a holistic approach if you really want to solve the problem rather than just declare one area a conservation zone. It might be good for that area, but it doesn't, it only shifts the problem, doesn't solve it. Yeah, I guess it's also an issue of what do we recognize as a conservation zone. So with these discussions of 30 by 30, one of the things they did do was acknowledge that indigenous stewardship was a form of conservation. Um, instead of you don't need to have something officially designated as a protected area or a national park for it to count towards these targets, which was important. Um, can I just pick up on this? Because I have a lot of things to say about 30 by 30, but I'm trying to sort of distill stuff. And I think this point about recognition, reification, and kind of evaluation of, of different kind of metrics is really crucial because you know when you think about this idea of recognizing indigenous stewardship under the sort of 30 by 30 scheme the immediate question that that comes to my mind is how would how would you recognize that and who would do the recognizing 
Um, and when you think about how that might apply to a place like, you know, Sarawak in Malaysian Borneo, for example, you know, where I've been working, um, which has an incredibly complex and in some ways quite archaic set of land recognition laws. You know, it's, it's very, very difficult to get your land recognized as customary indigenous mm -hmm. land for all sorts of reasons, um, which I'm not going to go into now. Um, <clears throat> this actually raises a, a, a sort of genuine question of, you know, what, what the politics of recognition might be and who gets to determine what gets recognized as such. Mm -hmm. So I think that is quite a significant issue in the sense that, you know, apart from simply criticizing, you know, 30 by 30 and saying, well, we need to move away from just fortress conservation and think more carefully about what, what indigenous stewardship of land is and recognize indigenous land rights. We also need to think very, very carefully about the mechanisms and the criteria through which we enact that process of recognition, because I could very easily see that feeding back into pre-existing political processes of disenfranchisement and dispossession. Um, and I'm quite happy to talk a bit more about that later on. Um, I, I think the sort of <clears throat> related question here is also what, what makes an indigenous community, which you know, I, I think, Murray, you absolutely um, rightly picked up on. Um, similarly, I've, you know, I've sort of worked in situations where <laughs> my indigenous interlocutors were not recognized as sufficiently indigenous by outside conservationists or, or, or activists precisely because they weren't necessarily practicing what the state or other parties defined as traditional indigenous lifestyles. And that was what qualified them to get aid and support and, and, and count as a real indigenous person. And what you then see is their indigeneity and also their sort of claims to land and their rights to autonomy and to carry on, you know, being, you know, planting cash crops, for example, or working on oil palm if they want, you know, whatever being consistently devalued because they did not fit that, that template of the ideal indigenous person. So I think we have to be really, really careful, you know, not only about criticizing the problems with big schemes like 3030, but also thinking quite critically about the mechanisms and the criteria through which we come to recognize certain things as such, because we don't want to end up reifying, you know, sort of trapping indigenous people in a stereotype that that's actually stops them from being who they are and, and living as they do in the contemporary world. And, and that's really tricky. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. And I think when we do tend to talk about indigenous people with conservation, it's always in terms of this positive environmental relationship. And conservationists really only care about indigenous peoples when they're working with Western conservation aims rather than against it. Um, I think We've got about half an hour left, so I'll open up if anyone in the floor has any questions they want to ask. Um, yeah, at the very back. Uh, thank you very much for the discussion. I really enjoyed it. Um, all of you talk quite a bit about climate inequality and how different groups experience it. And um, you identify groups, uh, indigenous groups, as the group that sort of suffered the most for, from climate change while not contributing that much to it. And I was wondering whether you can also easily, whether we can easily identify groups that are either benefiting or just not suffering as much. Um, so, for example, um, you mentioned authoritarian governments that might use uh, sort of climate intervention policy for their power, but we also mentioned, you also mentioned some um, foreign sort of minds, like or foreign capitalists. So, I was wondering if you can if we can easily specify whether it's the like national or foreign, foreign capitalists that are benefiting from these resource extractions or intervention policy, and whether those sort of systematic issues can be addressed in pragmatic climate policy, or whether these sort of, yeah, issues, we might not really solve them in terms of um, intersectionality and in climate injustice. Great, thanks. Um Alexander, I guess that relates to a lot of what you said. Would you like to start? Sure, and thank you so much for your question. Um, maybe in a very short way, like pragmatically, no. Um, <laughs> the evidence is very much against that right now. I mean, if we just look at like the last 10 years, the last 20 years in terms of uh, the problematic nature of what the impacts of climate change have wrought, let alone um, how things have just proceeded unabated as well, with very, very like missing targets continually, we would certainly say that a pragmatic approach is not working. Um, so there's, with any kind of environmental change, with any kind of conflict, there's always winners and there's always losers. Um, but that's never, that's never necessarily um, easy to parcel out in terms of where that exists. It, it's messy and complicated. And particularly in a globalised world, which I know that you'll be talking about later, 
those particular sort of relations are more entangled across like vaster sort of differences in different ways. Um, so it, it, it's difficult to say. Um, in, in, many, in many ways, um, climate change is providing um, the op certain opportunities for Indigenous groups um, and not necessarily in the ways that we're thinking about. With one of the communities that I'm working with, they're getting a large amount of, uh, of money um, in order uh, through the GEF in order to look at adaptation uh, programs in their particular village, especially around irrigation. It's actually the money that's coming in that's really important for them. And that money actually keeps uh, local youth in the village rather than having to migrate and in many ways thereby preserving uh, their customary relations and also the customary institutions that exist there. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it is hard and if, I think if we zoom out, we need to look though much more critically, I guess, at the role of capital and extractivity in the region, which have been strong drivers of economic generation over the last 20, 30 years, and are still seen as key viable parts for the way that Southeast Asia wants to develop. And I'm unsure about how well that will go hand in hand with meeting climate and environmental kind of imperatives that present themselves in a myriad of different ways. Thank you. Did anyone else want to add anything? I can add a little bit. So thank you for, for the question. It's really important actually because I, I did one of part of my research was called um, I I actually argued for a collateral benefits of red plus. <laughs> so I mean there are, there you know have been so many research about challenges and negative effect of red plus policy itself. So one of my finding that actually there was a collateral benefit. So at, at the national level in Indonesia, at that time, the, the one billion US dollar uh, pledged by Norway to Indonesia, and at the end spent maybe 350 million instead of one billion because it's performance based. So part of the money actually uh, managed to push the government of Indonesia to develop one map initiative, one map system. So it means that, you know, it used to be so many different maps used by different governments. That's why there has always been overlapping forest concessions. So this is one of the collateral benefits at the national level. On the ground, it's really interesting. When I went to the, my, my research was in central Borneo in 12 different villages. And one of the collateral benefits of this idea of transparency when it comes to reporting and monitoring actually went to the village because the villagers actually used not to have transparency when it comes to financial record from, you know, from the village government. And then with red plus mechanism, this, the, the money that went to the village needed to be reported and to be declared to all the villagers. So that was something that they learned how, how that actually all villagers almost had the agency to monitor the, the village government. And then of course the social learning occur in, you know, because of the, of, of the money, there was so much money actually, I mean, not as much as the pledge, the dis disbursement of the pledge was less than 10%, but still, you know, at that time, local communities, indigenous people were uh, being trained to conduct the participatory mapping of their land. And then again with this red plus money, the collateral benefit was that, uh, I cannot remember exact uh, million hectares, but actually some million hectares of land claimed by indigenous people community may need to be included within this uh, national map system. So that, that were the uh, collateral benefits of this international policy, thank you. Can I come back to that one? I have a sort of slight counter example, actually, which is um, <clears throat> that uh, we, we looked at a village where actually their participation or a certain family's participation in a conservation program actually ended up creating new inequalities within that village because the families, the very small number of families who were you know, active participants reaped a lot of benefits um, from you know, financial, I mean, all sorts of benefits from, from their participation in that scheme, but they ended up kind of shoving out <laughs> everyone else. Um, and that created a, a different sort of, it was more of a sort of conservation elite as opposed to a sort of government-centered elite or a kind of commercial elite within the village. So I think we have to be very aware of how a lot of these well-meaning interventions can also have interesting knock-on effects within local um, structures. Um, I'd also say that the entire sort of, you know, conservation, climate mitigation aid NGO field 
has in fact benefited from precisely that development of um, an emergency space in which a lot of these justifications are well funded and, and legitimated. Mm -hmm. I mean, where is a lot of this money coming from as well? I mean, especially when we look at the rise of philanthropic capitalism. I mean, mm -hmm. huge amounts of money being pledged in order to save the Amazon from Jeff Bezos, mm -hmm. who himself has benefited greatly from the destruction of the Amazon in many sort of ways. I mean, that's a very like cliched example. Um, but these particular rectangles are important to, to think about, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could say a lot, but I'm also a bit conscious of the time. So I wonder if we wanted to ask a few more um, people as in yeah, interventions. Yeah, see what questions yeah. we have. Um, do you want to go to the front? Taka, you can just pick. One of the suggestions has been that perhaps the challenge of all the issues that have been so readily identified today is the challenge of the principle of non-interference. I have a question with two parts. First question is, is the association we know as the European Union a good model that would lead to the, if it was adopted by ASEAN, would lead to these challenges being overcome? The second part is, although the European Union doesn't use the word interference, it is based on control. Given that the 675 million people in Southeast Asia, with one exception, Thailand, have all suffered decades, if not centuries, of colonization, would they accept, would they be likely to accept an unelected commission interfering in their sovereignty? I know, Mary, you mentioned non-interference in ASEAN. Well, yes, um, yes, uh, the nine, nine member states in ASEAN were colonized, uh, with the exception of Thailand. So, uh, the formation of ASEAN in 1967, August 1967, were very much, you know, built in a, you know, a strong, strong uh, philosophical belief that the member states do not want to be colonized anymore by any parties. So that that was that's why, um, whilst uh, most criticism directed towards ASEAN not being able to address transboundary urgent environmental issues were directed towards the policy of non-interference, ASEAN claims that actually with the policy of non-interference, ASEAN managed to uh, build the, they call it security community and the stability in the regions. And they claim that they actually managed to really uh, suppress the disputes, you know, not to develop into interstate conflict. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not really familiar with, uh, with the EU thing, but there is a difference between EU integration uh, based on uh, basically based, based on legal you know legal formalized uh, formal system with ASEAN harmonization, which actually that ASEAN ASEAN established the uh, regional framework or strategies, and then the national government the national government basically implement things based on their own capability and resources, which is basically the principle of uh, differentiated responsibility as also adopted by the UN. So my answer to that question, I don't think that ASEAN would, would go towards towards the same system as the EU. I think they, they, they really uh, you know still keep this principle of non-interference. I, I actually met quite a number of uh, ambassadors of ASEAN, whether when I was in Jakarta or, or in London. They, you know, in the, in the informal conversation, they would always say to me that actually we, we practice interference in Asian way. You know, so it's not, it's not like formal way of interference, but they also, oh, we interfere. Of course, we, we practice the interference, but we have ASEAN way in doing so. So, uh, so yes, I think, uh, but I, I cannot answer the question, which, which is actually really a research gap, whether the non-interference policy can address the transboundary urgent environmental issues, which seems not to be addressed until now. Yeah. Would anyone else like to respond? Um, well, I think um, any kind of um, integration process requires very stable, 
um, and robust institutions. And um, I think the EU even is, you know, challenged at times with that. Um, I think, you know, it needs to be organic. It needs to come from within. And um, there needs to be a rationale for why that's <coughs> needed. Um, maybe that's as much as I would say. I can't see it. I can't, I can't see it for that region at all, really. Um, what I can see is um, much stronger urges, and I, I see that more in Latin America than in, in Southeast Asia, but I think it's there too, is actually a much more desire for autonomy and self-determination. And maybe there is some level where the self-determination isn't hindered by um, addressing challenges that are greater, uh, that are more global in nature. So there needs to be kind of a two-tier approach where um, a lot more autonomy, autonomy is given to the local, um, the regional um, setting, but there needs to also be a very strong kind of way of, of addressing greater issues um, in the region together. That's mu as much as I would say from a, a bit of a lay person's perspective on this topic. Thank you very much. I think we'll move on to the next question in the second row on the right at the front. Great. Th <clears throat> Thank you so much. That was really excellent and uh, super interesting. I particularly appreciate the discussion about what an emergency is and, and Heike, your point about an emergency for who and uh, Liana about um, emergencies not being flat and the unevenness of emergencies. I wonder if there's also a problem with the rubric of the environmental emergency. And I think there's a lot of parallels with disaster studies in the natural disaster, that if the emergency is environmental, it implies that the solution is environmental. Um, so I suppose my question is, should we be using emergency at all, given that the three main characteristics of a definition of an emergency are sudden, unexpected, and let me just check, uh, urgent, which I think urgent is the only one that really stands up and, and passes there, should we instead be talking about disasters? Thank you. Maybe I'll start with a very general comment. I think what we've learned, um, fair to say, to generalize is that um, the best equipment that we can provide um, is for local communities to be as resilient as they can be so that they can help themselves, that they are equipped and um, um, kind of have enough social capital um, so that they can jump into action as quickly as possible. Um, and I think that is also linked with the, the topic of self, of autonomy and allowing the community be, to be resilient um, in, in that sense as well. So they know what is needed should an emergency occur. Um, and I think um, that elements of that include um, ingenuity, um, creativity, uh, responsiveness, things like that, that will be very much case by case. Um, and a lot of it is actually very dependent of social, social um, interactions, social connections. So the social fabric is incredibly important. And I know this from the community um, that I studied in Papua New Guinea, that sharing is incredibly vital. It's a huge um, norm in the community that everything is shared, um, that there is a very strong um, norm around looking after each other. Um, and the more that that is, you know, stays intact, I think, the better the local community will be to know to help themselves in the first instance. Mm -hmm. um, I, that's an interesting question. I, I'm just wondering if it's worth thinking about a shift from describing naming events, right, emergencies, mm -hmm. disasters, to maybe thinking more in terms of processes or dynamics. I mean, I, I'm just trying to, you know, I'm just sort of thinking off the top of my head here, but I mean, I think it's striking me that, <clears throat> you know, when you sort of name an event as such, that lends it a certain force and, you know, gives it access to certain resources. You, you name something a disaster or an emergency, <clears throat> excuse me, you get access to a vast pool of emergency funds. You legitimate very swift action that doesn't require, you know, pre-testing or kind of careful consideration. You just go straight in and you do it. Um, and this is something, you know, we, we often hear when we talk to conservationists, you know, to, to orangutan conservationists, 
where we sometimes go up to them and say, well, here, how about this alternative model? You know, instead of kind of jumping in and, and sealing off a large tract of forest from local people, spend some time engaging in, in regular long visits and building relations with them, come back regularly over the course of the year. And the answer is always, well, we can't because there's an emergency. You know, it's, it's too urgent. Orangutans are about to die. We do not have time for that slow engagement. And anyway, our funders wouldn't give us backing for that, right? So there's, there's kind of both of that going on. Um, and so I'm just wondering whether, in, in a way, it's, it's also about shifting the way we know, we come to know and describe things. Um, and I think that's also related, that's also related to your question about whether we still use the term environmental. Um, I, I've, got, I've got issues with it, um, partly because I think that tends to kind of to conjure these images of, of pristine, peopleless environments, you know, that are threatened by people. Um, that's the entire premise of fortress conservation. Um, but of course, you know, if you're working in a place like Borneo, what looks from the outside like an environment is a peopled environment. Um, that's just what it is. Um, and, and so the question is, how do you then kind of, how do you account for that, that social, social natural, you know, do you call it environment? Do you call it anthropogenic? What do you call it? Something in between. You know, in, in, in my work, sometimes I just don't use any of these terms. I use, uh, I use abong, which in, in Bideyu means our area. Um, and, and that sort of captures that intersection. And sometimes you want to use a different term entirely, you know, rather than, than different terms with existing baggage. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think there is a question on the left in the front. Front? No, uh, front as in towards me. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a question actually related to what you, uh, we talked about just now, about the uh, sense of urgency or sense of everyday um, dailiness. And when we talk about indigenous people, we, talk, we, we imagine that there's a, there's a link between the land and the people, and that link shall not be broken. So from that note, I was wondering what is the panel's views on the, the, the concept or, uh, of environmental migration. It's getting more and more interesting um, from a student's point of view. I, I've marked several dissertations on that already. I was wondering if you see this as a response uh, response to an urgency, response to a disaster, or can it be a practice? Some people argue that it's, well, we, we flee from the uh, affected area anyway. Or is that a, 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 some kind of a policy that can actually be pre-planned? So that's my curiosity, and I hope that I can get some of the insights. But another question I have is to, uh, what uh, Mari mentioned, that, uh, the illegal fishing. We know that the Indonesian fishers are actually a main <coughs> suppliers of the fishing industry to Taiwan, uh, in, uh, South Korea, and Japan. But my impression is that the uh, Indonesian fishers are also very auto uh, autonomous in terms of uh, their self-organized uh, um, um, grassroots uh, activism. I wonder if there's any link between the, uh, any possible way that Indonesian fishers can resp um, correspond to the, the, the government's policies in terms of their well-being and also the, the fishing industry overall. Thank you. Yes, I, I mean, I, I haven't done, I haven't done my own, thank you very much for, for the question. I haven't done my own research on my students when, when it comes to fishing, but I, I, I I remember that I was I was in an event in Jakarta one time and I met this this uh, the the leader the leader of Fisher organization nationally in Indonesia you know at you know at at the dinner and then he was actually very angry with certain policies at that time released by then the lady lady minister of uh, of Indonesia you know uh, Susi Pujastuti at that time. Because as you said, that the, the Fisher organization in Indonesia is really powerful and they are very strong. And uh, so there are, there are quite a number of policies that this lady minister uh, enacted were supported. For example, the, the, the sinking of the foreign vessels because with the climate change, apparently, there is a shift of you know, distribution and migration of fish across border in Southeast Asia. So basically, the, the lady minister would say, OK, you know, and, and Vietnam uh, and neighboring countries would argue that their fishers actually tried to catch their own fish who migrated to Indonesian Ocean you know, talking about migration. And then the Indonesian minister basically said, well, 
you need to wait until the fish migrated back to your ocean. So that was, that was her response. So in this particular policy was supported by uh, the fisher organization. There are quite a number of policies were not supported because the, the lady minister basically kept you know, the, you know, the special species, you know, at a special amount, and then the organization of fishers in Indonesia, you know, disagree with it because they wanted to, you know, to, to be able to fish the whole, the whole year, for example. So, um, yes, and, and on the environmental migration, uh, I, think, I think there are cases when it comes to the uh, hydropower, the dam development in the Mekong, where actually there were so many local people displaced by this infrastructure development, particularly in Laos. That's the, uh, I don't know the number, but yes, that, that happening still there. I, just, I think in the interest of time so that we can get a couple more questions in, we'll move on to one more or two more, I think on the right, and then we'll go. So that'll be the last three, I think. Thanks so much. So I guess the question is, who do you trust to do this? If the state is captured by extractive industries' interests, is that useful to engage with the state? Or do you need something, a bigger institution that's been captured by conservation interests, like the World Bank or the EU or uh, the global economic was it, environmental facility, the GEF that you were talking about. Who, who tells these people? I mean, Southeast Asian countries generally aren't very keen on decentralization and autonomy. Just look at Iri and Jaya. Is anyone able to offer a one minute response to that one? <laughs> I think my, my counter question is what, what is this? Um, I, I think the sort of danger is wanting to devise blanket or sort of homogenized solutions for what is in fact a very, very fragmented and very internally autonomous region. Um, and maybe that this needs to be, this is a bunch, of diff a bunch of different things that may not necessarily be implemented well by a centralized or, or sort of uniform power. I'm actually with you, like I don't know whom to trust, basically, you know, the more I learn about this whole network of actors. Of course, you know, by concept, the more actors we bring in, the better, because, you know, these actors bring different resources. And, you know, then there is, you know, more thinking and then more resources and more transparency. But I'm with you with that question. <laughs> I think um, some ideas would be decision making the closest to the people as possible has generally worked out well. Um, and also um, co-management, um, you know, um, inclusiveness in, in, in the political process, bringing all sorts of different stakeholders to the tables rather than making backhand deals. And these kinds of things are incredibly vital, I think, in, in creating trustworthy institutions and processes and politics, I mean, politics are always a game, but you know, to, to make them as transparent maybe as, as one can. Thanks. Um, so we, I'll take the question from Catherine and then Winnie, and if we can just get them both and then answer them with the remaining time. Right, thank you so much for a fabulous panel. I've learned so much from it. Following on from Bill's question, given the increasing importance and focus on the Indo-Pacific of a number of actors around the world, in order to address some of the issues that you've identified, what would you recommend people do? And that could be people as in people within states that are not in the Indo-Pacific, that could be governments. But maybe more importantly, given that governments are increasingly looking towards the Indo-Pacific, what do you want them not to do? So what things, what policies should be absolutely avoided to try and stop making things worse? Thank you. And then the question from Winnie, so if you can keep that question in mind. Um, thank you very much uh, for some really interesting talks. Um, it kind of touches on the last two questions and uh, I guess linking to some of the other questions as well is when I'm looking at, we talked about labels and we talked about the different stakeholders and what resources they bring to the table and that kind of stuff. The, f the well, I guess, was described as the fragmented nature of, of the region. Um, the, I just keep on looking at the title when it says environmental emergencies and I just, I think the key thing we're talking about is more, and it sounds negative, but I don't mean it to, deficits, yeah. There's environmental deficits. If we're talking about infrastructure, if we're talking about skill sets, technology, um, understanding of the environment it itself and, and what's happening, I was wondering if, if you guys could, 
perhaps prioritize one or two deficits that you would uh, you would see as what needs to be fundamental targets that need need to be addressed in order to ad redress these kinds of issues. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so what should we do, what shouldn't we do, and what should we target um, with, with one minute to spare? Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, thank you for your questions. Um, I might just say, I, I, I might push back against that a little bit and say that I don't think there is technical, I mean, I think this is a common trope that we can fall into in terms of like the problem is that we don't have this, the kind of like socio-technical or managerial kind of interventions that are required. We don't have enough finance. These aren't necessarily the particular issues that are driving um, a lack of change in terms of what's needed and necessary. Um, I, I think there's a vast amount of knowledge that's, that already exists within that. This is, a this is a region which actually like all regions is fractured. All regions are, differ are differentiated and uneven and they exist like that. Um, so it's a difficult question to ask and answer. I think the real challenge is um, as perhaps might have already been raised, bringing those different sort of voices and those different sort of actors to a particular site where legitimate kind of decision making uh, can actually take place in terms of the kind of outcomes and futures that different people want. And different people want different futures, especially when it comes to the environment or, or where they're existing. Um, in terms of, and in that case, maybe it's easy for me to say what I don't think we should do or perhaps we need to move away from. And I think that's a, a moving away from climate capitalism. Um, I, I think particular solutions that have been put into, in place around especially uh, REDD Plus or looking at carbon markets are just not significant enough in terms of bringing about the kind of change that's, that's needed and necessary. And in fact, it, it might seem as optimistic, but I mean, thinking through, uh, processes uh, around degrowth um, and how that is necessary for bringing through climate justice, but also entangling the current conditions to, um, that, that exist within Southeast Asia um, to what exists here in the global north as well and how those are interrelated. So to address both questions together, I think one important element actually for the answer is to um, address the huge inequities that exist, not only within countries, but globally, and that are so enormous. Um, I'm not talking about small, little, you know, but actually, I mean, the billionaires versus those who have um, systematically no access to anything. And to not, um, generate a big, you know, help generate a bigger schism than already exists. But anything that helps for us to actually close this tri this enormous gap in inequality across what I think is fundamental. Thank you. I think you've both answered the way I would have answered. Um, so uh, the only thing I'd add is, you know, I, I think it's I think it's really worth channeling more support towards grassroots organizations. There are many grassroots organizations and movements that we don't necessarily hear about from over here, um, but that are forming really interesting and important alliances across differences. And actually, rather than trying to impose blanket solutions on the places where they are, are working through that difference and that pluralism. And I think that is something that really is worth trying to support rather than co-opt you know, to, to suit our ends. Um, to me, science, policy, communication, and back to you, which actors do we trust? I think it's very important that we academic communities and researchers really communicate research findings and science to, you know, political decision makers, you know, in a different level of governments. And um, we haven't spoken about land grab, for example, and then, you know, local governments in the case of Indonesia would just you know, be very happy to receive any type of investment for agricultural land to be planted, but actually the crop itself would not stay, you know, locally, but they would be shipped to the investor countries. So this is something that they do not understand, I don't believe so. So communicating this type of, you know, knowledge and science and discussion, very important to reach them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're going to break for lunch, which will be downstairs, and we'll be back at 1.30 for session two on the end of globalization. So thank you very much. Thank you.